Welcome to the 40th Annual Preaching with Power, sponsored by the Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary. For 40 years, our seminary has hosted this annual spring event, bringing to our community the finest in African-American preaching and scholarship. Today, the Reverend Dr. Stephen G. Ray, Jr., the former president of Chicago Theological Seminary, but also the former Jeremiah A. Wright, Senior Associate Professor of Theology and African American Studies here at United Lutheran Seminary, is our lecturer on today. Listen as you celebrate Preaching with Power with us. Please consider a donation to one of our scholarship funds. Information on how to give will be shown on the screen at the end of this event. But if you miss it, you can always reach out to the Urban Theological Institute, UTI, at the seminary, and you can always mail a gift to our Philadelphia campus to the attention of UTI. So on today, you get to see two of those students who are beneficiaries of what you give. Today, I want to recognize the two students in our Master of Arts degree program with the highest cumulative GPA who have completed their first year of studies, but not yet been awarded the J.Q. Jackson Merit Award. All of our students get funds from the J.Q. Jackson Scholarship, but these two with the highest GPA who have not been rewarded this so far are being recognized with an award that pays for one course of study. Well, would you join me in congratulating Marcel Ankrum and Kim Beelan. We are so proud of them today and we wish them Godspeed. Congratulations, Marcel and Kim. Now we will hear greetings from the president of our seminary, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin. In addition, he will also introduce our lecturer, Following our president, we will have a musical selection from Scott Cumberbatch, and then we will hear from our lecturer on today, Dr. Stephen G. Ray Jr. I'm Dr. Guy Irwin, president of United Lutheran Seminary, and I want to add to today's program a special personal introduction and welcome to the Reverend Dr. Stephen G. Ray Jr., who is our lecturer this year at Preaching with Power. Dr. Ray and I have been friends for many years, going back to the time we spent together as graduate students at Yale. And it's a wonderful thing that he is willing to come back and share his wisdom with us. Dr. Ray had a, a formative impact on the Urban Theological Institute as its first executive director while he served on the faculty at the Lutheran Theological Seminary of Philadelphia one of our predecessor institutions. It's great to have him back as we welcomed him last year to receive one of ULS's first honorary doctorates. It's great to have double Dr. Ray back with us again. 
My name is Stephen Ray, and I am very happy to be here with you. I'm deeply honored by the invitation to come and share uh, some thoughts with you um, in this lecture for the 2022 Preaching with Power series. I want to begin by just expressing my joy at being with you uh, once again, as many of you know, uh, ULS uh, uh, shares a special place um, in my heart because of my time that I spent at one of its predecessors, uh, LTSP. So I want to uh, say how happy and honored I am to be sharing this with you and also to give thanks to President Guy Irwin and to Dr. Quentin Robinson for the uh, kind and generous invitation to share with you. I'd like to send greetings to the faculty there at ULS, to the students, um, and to all of the supporters of this fine seminary and this wonderful program. So once again, uh, please accept my thanks for being with you. And uh, let's turn now to the lecture. So what I'm going to be doing in this lecture is I'm going to be doing a bit of cult cultural anthropology about identity formation and its importance within the Black community within this particular historical moment. And then I'm going to raise some questions for the church and for theological education more generally. The title of the lecture is Who Are the Blacks? and how will they save us? Who are the Blacks and how will they save us? Now, as a way of beginning, let me talk a little bit about the importance of communal self-identification. And by that, I mean by the way that people within a discrete community define themselves and name themselves as a way of both a mirror, but then also as an outlooking way in terms of how they are placing themselves within the society which in which they find themselves. Now, the importance of a communal self-identity is because it creates a grounding which can be generate, which can be transmitted across generations. It can provide the opportunity to answer the question both for contemporary uh, generations, but then future generations, who are we and where do we come from and what kind of future do we aspire to have? Now, certainly because of the uh, unique sort of historical realities of the sons and daughters of Africa who landed on these shores of the United States, that has always been a point of contestation because there is a significant sort of way in which whenever you're talking about a minoritized community, you're talking about a community that has to assert itself over and against the larger society, which frequently does not have the best interest of that community at heart and is sometimes antagonistic, which has been the reality of Black people since coming to these shores. So the particular importance then of uh, issues of communal identity and self-identification um, are uh, uh, substantial when we talk about uh, specifically our community. And it's, been that and it's been that way since our arrival. Now, there are many who will want to reduce this whole conversation about communal self-identity to simply identity politics. And we often hear that, uh, particularly in terms of the politics of the left and most certainly uh, the politics of conservatism. Well, you know, I mean, the reality is that I don't know how any community um, struggles to fulfill its aspirations if it does not have a healthy and accurate uh, self-identity through which it is moving through the world. So the importance then of the self-identity as we talk about it is that it's a grounding a grounding for the historical moment that you are in, but then also a grounding in terms of how it is that you shape um, your community and the generation that comes after so that you give them something to hold on to. Uh, now, when we talk about this piece about communal self-identification, one of the things that we'll want to um, sort of lay as the groundwork is that it changes through time. 
It shifts over time and it shifts in response to the particular sort of challenges, opportunities, as well as realities of the in the current historical moment. Now, usually those shifts are occasioned by a dislocation within the um, community, a, a substantial sort of uh, change in the economic landscape in which it exists, and also when there actually has to be a physical relocation of the community. Now, these often call, cause crises, and when crises arise, um, what ends up happening is that a particular sort of communal formulation may not be sufficient to deal with the challenges that are facing that community. And that's when we see the rise of different uh, forms of communal identity. So, for instance, when we're talking about the Black community, uh, we've gone from everything in the uh, 18th century from being um, African um, to being African-American at the end of the 20th century, coming into this century, um, interspersed with being Negro, colored, Afro-American, um, and a few other sort of monikers. But all of those changes have been occasioned um, by significant sort of shifts in terms of the reality of the community. So from the beginning uh, uh, of the migration um, uh, on these shores, um, uh, the, the chain has been uh, African, Negro, colored, Afro-American, and African-American. Now, these changes uh, were connected uh, with significant sorts of dislocations uh, related to, uh, one, um, our freedom from enslavement, two, the rise and demise of Reconstruction, Three, the Great Migration, which in uh, uh, gender, a significant sort of uh, violent racial backlash in the period immediately following uh, World War II, on to the rise of the um, uh, a large Great Migration uh, and into the Civil Rights Movement and on through the Black Power Movement. Now, all of these were periods in which not only uh, were Black people going through significant changes, but our communities were substantially uh, changing in their reality and very frequently under serious threat. So when we talk about the shifting of communal uh, reality, how people are naming themselves and how uh, they are in the public square saying that they will exist um, becomes critically important. Uh, so I've just gone through uh, the journey that um, uh, Black communities have gone through, um, all the way from um, African to African-American uh, over the course of about 300 years uh, with interspersing uh, points. But now one thing I want to lift up that's going to be at the center of this lecture that uh, helps make the title make sense, Who are the Blacks? and how they save us, is that the thread that has wound through the entire history of uh, the uh, sons and daughters of Africa who found themselves on these shores is Black. It is a Black thread that has run through it all. Now, what I mean by that is that as early as Shays' Rebellion in the 18th century, through the 19th century and the 20th century on to today, there has been a latent identity which has periodically been insurgent during times of communal crisis and acted as a bridge to a new self-identity for the heirs of the transatlantic slave trade who landed on these shores. Now, by a bridge, what I mean is that when particular syntheses of political and economic aspirations unraveled, the reigning modes of self-identity became obsolete. During these periods, as long as a decade, uh, Black became the preferred term for self-identification. Usually this followed, uh, was followed by the rise of a new mode of identity and this new identity formation became historically dominant and Black would recede, though never quite disappear. And what I mean by this is that 
during a period when the predominant ways in which Black people self-identify, uh, which was as African, and that's from largely uh, the latter half of the 18th century on through uh, the 18, 18 teens and early 20s, uh, the self-identification was and described as African, which is why we have the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Uh, if you go to Boston, you find the African Baptist Church was the first church that was founded by Bryant and Lyle. If you go to New England, you find that the first churches that were founded um, in other parts um, of New England, Connecticut, uh, with which I'm also familiar, there was the African Union Meeting House. If you go to uh, Philadelphia, you find the same thing. You find the same thing in New York. So for that period, the predominant way that people describe themselves was as um, African. But there was also a part of the population that was describing themselves as Black. If we move on through the 18th century, uh, we go through colored and Negro uh, cohabiting at the same time uh, through the mid um, 19th century, but there's still a community uh, and still some people who are referring to themselves as Black. And usually these are the people who are trying to create an insurgent identity, um, an identity that will distinguish them uh, over and against from the larger society. And we find this again once we come to the 20th century. So one of the most notable figures of the early 20th century um, was Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey routinely referred to himself as a Black man. Now, this was in the age of the Negro because um, Elaine Locke and others were trying to discover, well, who will be the new Negro? At the same time, there was significant and substantial ferment uh, among Black folk. So when I talk about Blackness, then what I'm trying to say is that there was a thread that has run all the way through that even though there was a dominant identity that was not Black, it was either Negro or it was colored or it was African, was what was most descriptive of the community. There was still this thread uh, that ran through and the thread uh, was the thread of Blackness. Now, the point I, you know, about making this is that this thread not only uh, ran through um, the community, but would also present itself at critical moments when the particular sort of reigning self-identity was becoming obsolete. Now, to talk about what it means for a cultural identity to become obsolete is when the aspirations that are attached to it the presumptions that are attached to it don't make sense in the changing historical milieu in which people find themselves. So for instance, the one that we are most familiar with is in terms of how the Negro uh, of the early and mid 20th century, a part of that central um, identity was an aspiration toward a particular kind of inclusion within American society. And that kind of inclusion was encapsulated with the idea of integration. And one of the things that became clear was that with the success of the civil rights movement um, uh, and the uh, concomitant backlash that began to take shape and, ch and take form, integration um, as the greatest good or the summum bonum, as we would call um, in theology, uh, simply was not appropriate any longer. And there was a shift to begin to talk about Blackness and to begin to talk about Black power, to begin to talk about Black empowerment, to begin to talk about Black self-determination. Now, one of the things that you'll note if you pay attention to history is that the period in which Blackness sort of predominated only lasted for a little bit less than a decade because very quickly we moved then from Afro-American to African-American. And those two identities, as they became fused, were the reigning ways 
in which both we identified ourselves and which the larger society identified us for nearly 30 years. Now, um, many of you have lived through that. You can remember when you were doing the census form and you had to check a box, right? If you are of a certain age, at some point to the government, you were a Negro. If you are, are of another certain age, at some point, you were an Afro-American. And if you live in the age of which everyone in this room is living, then the last census form you checked was one that said Black slash African-American. So the point being then that Blackness as an identity has created a bridge during times of crisis and great change. And it arose and continues to arise and reigns as the primary identity of the Black community for um, uh, um, a decade, maybe more, but particularly in terms of times of challenge and trial when one identity is becoming obsolete, but another identity hasn't emerged yet. So when you're going from Negro to Afro-African-American and that period in between is when virtually anyone that you talk to would tell you that they were black. Um, uh, if you go back to um, the 19th century, particularly the period um, immediately Following the Civil War, um, you'll find increasing numbers of people describing themselves as Black. Uh, if you go to the period of the Harlem Renaissance um, and the 20s going into the 30s, as we're migrating to the sort of uh, normativity of the designation Negro, you'll still find within that period of the beginning of the Great Migration on through the mid um, 1930s, uh, uh, increasing numbers of people referring to themselves as Black. So now I'm going to pull this all together so that it makes some sense and so that this lecture won't be um, of interest only to specialists in cultural anthropology, um, uh, racial anthropology, and history. And I'm going to pull it together in this way. I'm going to give you a bit of a narration of history, and that will help uh, uh, give you a sense of the importance of this conversation. On November 2nd, 2010, an all-out assault was begun against the progress which African Americans had achieved over the previous two decades. Now, I'm specifically talking about the communal formation of African-Americans. The assault culminated in what I describe as the defeat of the African-Americans on November 8th, 2016. On that day, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States on an explicitly white nationalist platform, which he put in motion beginning his first days in office. Uh, I say it was the substantial defeat of the African-Americans because it was the national repudiation of President Barack Hussein Obama and all that he represented. Now, certainly we won in terms of numbers, but we still lost the election. And we will be living with that consequence for at least the next two decades. Um, Barack Obama was what I describe as the apotheosis of African-American political, economic, and cultural aspirations. And by that, I mean, he was the epitome of what it was that we were trying to achieve within our society. We were trying to achieve a place in which there was no space that was unavailable to us. There was no door that was closed. Our political and economic might had reached the point that we were able to elect the first African-American president or the first black president of the United States. African-Americans of a certain age saw in him all they had hoped for their children when the doors of opportunity had begun to crack open a bit in the 60s and 70s. The fulfillment 
of the dreams of the students at Hillman College in the 1980s when they were inhabiting a different world. Now, if we look at this, this fulfillment, the uh, rise of the Tea Party was not just a backlash, but it was an all out assault against all of them. And the final election of Donald J. Trump was the culmination. And that's why I say that it was the ultimate defeat of the African-American, because at that point, the particular sort of cultural, um, economic, as well as political synthesis um, that had that identity make sense was beginning to dissolve. Uh, if you were a fan of The Cosby Show, um, or if you were a fan of Living Single, or if you were a fan of any of that array, um, the world that it imagined was slowly being, or the world that they imagined was slowly being taken apart. And we can see that when we step back and look at the signal importance of the 2016 election, and the victory of white nationalism as the governing regime of the United States. So I'm just gonna list a few here. The normalization of racial and ethnic bigotry in the public square. There are ways over the last six years that we have seen open displays of racism and bigotry that would have been unimaginable 20 years ago. We've heard utterings from public officials that would have been um, uh, just out of order 30 years ago, but now they've become the daily fare, the daily fare uh, of many who are on the airwaves, and unfortunately, the daily fare of many who hold public office. The loss of the Supreme Court for at least a generation. Uh, there's, and I don't have to tell you, there is a current Supreme Court um, majority. Um, it's a six to three majority who are openly antagonistic to the aspirations of black people and openly antagonistic to the aspirations that were given voice to in terms of the vision of the world of the African-Americans. Um, they did take over by the party that was dedicated to this new regime of white supremacy, the takeover of a majority of state legislatures and courts. So what that means is that um, not only do we find ourselves with a Supreme Court that is antagonistic um, to the aspirations of black people, but we also find state legislatures. So that's why we have battles like the one uh, over critical race theory, which is actually uh, a battle to erase black people from the history of this nation. It doesn't have anything to do with feelings. It has everything to do with erasure. Um, uh, so we're in the midst of that struggle. We also have the sustained assault on the voting rights of black people, primarily, but also other people of color, redistricting along racial lines. And finally, we are in the midst of a political battle for the very survival of Black voting rights in vast parts of this country. So all of these realities were set in motion because of um, um, that, uh, the white backlash that culminated in the election of Donald J. Trump and his white nationalist um, regime. Um, and its way of restructuring American power. So our community finds itself in the midst of a time of crisis and in the midst of a time of dislocation. Uh, and part of what uh, we'll want to know um, is that uh, the aspirations of a particular moment in history when the Black community um, uh, described itself, or let me put it this way so I can be explicitly accurate. When the sons and daughters of Africa who found themselves on these shores, when their descendants primarily described themselves as African-Americans uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and in the early aughts, that identity will not sustain us going into the future. Beyond uh, symbolic victories, we are in the midst of fighting a rear guard action because uh, those 
uh, aspirations and the worlds in which they existed simply no longer exist. So let me give you a concrete example of what I mean by that. One of the first things that um, uh, um, President Trump did was, and some of you may remember this, during the first week, there was a sea of pink slips that were sent to people um, in the federal government who did not have union protections um, as a way of cleansing the government. One of the places that was cleansed was the State Department. Now, what the State Department does is that um, it is our face to the world. And um, in the 1970s and 80s, there were uh, programs put in place to significantly diversify um, the State Department in terms of people who were operating at more than secretarial and lower level managerial positions. Um, the program was significantly successful. So there were Black ambassadors. There were Black um, assistant ambassadors to places around the world, as well as the staff that would uphold them. Um, within the span of a month, um, the fruits of that program that had taken over 30 years uh, to achieve were virtually wiped out because all of the uh, um, all the Black people who did not have union protections were pink slipped. So that's what I mean by overnight, um, uh, because that kind of program was at the core of um, the aspirations, or at least one of the aspirations um, of uh, African Americans, which was that we would become such an integral part of our society that when it had a public face, we would be a part of that public face. It's going to take another 30 or 40 years to get back to where we were in terms of representation in the State Department and other places uh, within the federal government um, uh, uh, because of uh, this white nationalist agenda. But the point is that um, we're going to have to fight for what we had, and that's going to be the case across a broad spectrum. So. We're at a point now where besides symbolic victories, uh, Vice President uh, Kamala J. Harris, um, uh, the uh, emerging uh, nominee for the Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, Ketanji Brown um, Jackson, uh, these are all victories, but we should be clear, these are symbolic victories because on the ground in terms of economic reality, in terms of cultural and political reality, um, we are in the midst of a significant time of crisis and peril uh, for our community. So we are at a time of change. Now, as we begin to talk about how blackness is working in this time of change, let me start uh, by shifting a little bit. I remember I said that there was a thread that continues to run through and asserts itself. Well, the way that I describe it is that, you know, one of my favorite groups in the 90s was Naughty by Nature. And when I think about um, this sort of um, uh, in, in a scholarly way, Tretch was never an African-American. Of the many things he was, he was never an African-American. He was black, he may have referred, and he did refer to himself in other ways. But the point I wanna make is that um, this is that thread that I'm talking about. It's that it's a symbol of a kind of insurgent and consistent identity within the black community that resists the kind of onslaught and annihilation of obsolete identities or identities that are moving uh, to within obsolescence. Blackness had a vibrant place in the insurgent cultural forms of hip hop that resisted um, the sort of co-option of class and culture genuflections which attended the aspirations of African-Americans. So at this time of peril, at this time of sort of dislocation, uh, within our community when we're fighting uh, not only for um, uh, uh, continued economic vibrancy, but for a very place within our society because we have to fight in order to have our history taught 
uh, within the society. Um, it was largely hip hop culture that kept the thread of blackness alive. And so one of the things that we find is that over the course of the last decade, um, the number of public presentations of people referring to themselves as African-Americans has been steadily declining. And the number of people within our community who simply describe us and our community as Black has become ascendant. So when you talk about Black girl magic, right, when you talk about any of the other sorts of ways that we talk about the creative energies within our community, you virtually never see these days a significant evocation of the identity of African-American, you find more so um, it is Black. And so as we're looking at that, what I want us to note is that um, uh, uh, the Blackness that we're talking about um, is one that means that we're in a period of significant reorganization. Um, now, I fully expect that within the next uh, 20, 30 years, if history is a guide, there will be another way that we, the descendants of the daughters and sons of Africa who found themselves on these shores, identify ourselves. I don't know what that will be. I don't know exactly how that will shape itself. But what I do know, and I'm very clear about, is that until that identity arises, Blackness will be the idiom through which um, our community describes itself and moves through the world. It will be the source of identity. It will be the space of generativity. It will be a place of refuge. Now, this holds particular kinds of um, important implications because what it means is that um, there are entire ways that uh, in terms of not just self-description with words, but in terms of self-identity, the Black community will be going through significant changes, changes as substantial as when we were moving from being Negroes to being Black. And anyone who lived through that period um, knows how significant and substantial that period was in terms of shaping what the next 20 or 30 years would look like after that. Because we were looking for a very different world than the people who were at that time uh, living at the zenith of the era of the Negro. So we were looking for a different world. We wanted a very different world than they wanted. We wanted a world of Black flourishing, but we offered different descriptions. And I want to argue, and at center of this lecture has been that that is the case with Black people today and with, um, that is the case with Black people today and with um, uh, um, the African-Americans. So the African-Americans uh, continue to fight the rear guard action. And in some ways and significant ways, uh, certainly I'm a part um, of that generation, but I was also a part of the earlier generation of the black people who emerged from the Negroes. So with each of these um, uh, sort of realities that I've been talking about, blackness takes on a new function and there are new challenges. So this is where I talk about the thumbnail of the Blacks. So what I want to ask is, who are the Blacks today and how will they lead us? What are going to be their dreams about what our society and who they should be in? it? What are their hopes for what the world that they give to their children will be? And the reason why I'm posing the question in that way is because I'm going to turn now very specifically um, to the challenge um, uh, that I think is before us who are gathered here today, the challenge of, of, of the church and theological education. Um, because uh, Blackness, as we talk about it um, uh, in these times, has been largely shaped by hip hop culture, 
um, and it is largely diasporic, um, which means that um, it includes in its own self-identity, its own thinking, um, the daughters and sons of Africa who landed on other shores. Um, and because it is uh, open to the leadership of female and queer people in ways that previous iterations of Blackness never would have been, um, as it evolves and becomes the seedbed, if you will, um, the holding container um, for our community as we move into the future, as we begin to think, what does a post white nationalist America look like? What does a post white supremacist America look like? Uh, certainly we won't be out of that, but it won't be the reigning regime of the nation 30 years from now. So what does that world look like? So when we talk about who are the Blacks, my a question in this historical moment is where is the church in all of this? The church has always played a significant and substantial role uh, throughout the history of the Black community, both in times of peril and in times of joy. And what I'm challenging uh, the church um, to uh, do today in the form of all of us who are engaged in ministry is to be self-aware of the work that we're doing in relation to this moment of change. As new identities are being constructed, as new aspirations for our community are being given voice, for us to be aware and for us to be um, cognizant of our role of being stewards of the traditions of our people, but also being um, those who will be midwives for whatever becomes of our community. Because the point is, um, and our challenge is that very much of this creativity is happening uh, outside of the doors of the traditional church very much of the percolating sort of vibrancy in terms of this new celebration of Blackness is not happening in our sanctuaries. So how is it that Black churches, Black religious communities can be partners in the spaces in which this is happening? Um, and we saw that, you know, very significantly and continue to see it in the Black Lives Matter movement um, in the other kinds of racial justice movements is that um, uh, this, uh, uh, the energy of this Blackness is one that is being born on the street. So how can we partner with it so that as stewards of the grand traditions of um, our people that we don't allow those traditions to become anchors that weigh down and that lock in place um, this next generation with the dreams that we have for a world that no longer exists. So that's the first challenge that I want to um, lay out. The second challenge that I want to lay out is very specifically to theological education. I have spent my um, entire, um, uh, almost my entire career and almost my entire adult life engaged in theological education. And one of the things I understand about the importance of theological education is that um, it becomes, um, uh, uh, even with all of its challenges, um, even with all of its um, issues um, in terms of uh, kind of uh, often being a colonial structure um, that pass, passes forward um, ideas about the faith that um, are oppressive and uh, finally white supremacists, even with all of those issues, it is still true that there is an entire generation of people who are leading this reconfiguration of Blackness who would not have heard of James Cone, who would not have heard of Katie Geneva Cannon, who would not have heard of any of the pound P of great Black religious thinkers had they not encountered them in seminary. So theological education plays a significant role, but with that role, I think, comes responsibility. I think that in the same way that the Black church 
in particular, and the larger church more generally, has a responsibility to be a partner with this emerging sort of reality um, uh, that's coming because of the crisis within which the Black community finds itself, institutions of theological education, uh, such as the ones that I led at Chicago Theological Seminary, as well as the uh, United Lutheran Seminary, have a responsibility to be good partners in this project. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that I am very clear about, and I want you all to be very clear about, is that the welfare of the Black community is inextricably bound to the destiny of this nation, and it has always been the case. The welfare of the Black community was the occasion upon which this nation ripped itself apart and had um, one of the bloodiest civil wars um, in the history of humanity. The um, uh, uh, welfare of the Black community stands today as the litmus test in terms of the battle against uh, critical race theory, which is really the battle against teaching that Black people have any, hist have any place within the history or the current reality of this nation is the battleground upon which we are fighting for the vitality and very life of the democracy of this nation. So when I talk about the church having a responsibility, theological education having a responsibility, it is because it is simply the reality that the fate of the Black community is the fate of our nation. So having given you these challenges, um, and hopefully having given you a new way to think about not just this moment, but perhaps a bit more about the history of the Black community here in America, um, I'm going to close the lecture. And once again, I want to thank um, President Irwin and uh, Dr. Robertson for this wonderful opportunity to be with you. I am deeply honored. Um, and I send my best regards to the faculty, students, and community of supporters of this fine seminar. Thank you once again, and blessings to you all. Thank you for joining us. And now I invite you to share a gift as you are moved by God's spirit to support our students who are studying and preparing for ministry. On the screen are ways that you can give both online and via US mail. Our main scholarship that supports all of our students in the Black Church concentration is the JQ Jackson Scholarship. We ask that you consider a gift to that fund but you also have an opportunity to support students who are members of the Church of God in Christ through the Bishop Ernest C. Moore Scholarship Fund, and then African-American students who are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America through the Grover and Irma Wright Scholarship Fund. I have made this request to our alumni this year, and so I ask our friends and all who are watching to give above your normal gifts this year at least consider $40 above that amount that you normally would give in light of our 40th annual Preaching with Power. And so as you consider a gift, I thank you in advance for your gift and your support for our seminarians who are preparing for ministry. And please know that this gift is both temporal and eternal because when you invest in a seminarian, you invest in ministry.